Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of a new series here on the show. This is the How to Pilot series, where I'm going to be exploring different decks on the decklist database with their respective pilots. Today we're going to be joined by the wonderful Ken Bauman, the author of the Siskel and Ebert Primer and decklist on the decklist database. I won't give the deck too much introduction or anything because me and Ken really get into it. As you can see down with the timer, this is a really long video. So I'm just going to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Check out TCG Player. Hit that TCG Player affiliate link in the video description if you want to pick up any cards for this deck or any other deck. Hit up our Patreon if you want to give some direct support to me and the channel. For as little as $2 a month, you can get access to our Discord. We play games, workshop decks, all sorts of fun stuff like that. And you can also pick up merch through our bonfire link that's also in the video description as well as playmat store inked gaming store and without further ado let's hop into it go take a look at kark and sakashima with ken yeah. right, so ken you are the father here you're the uh the self-dubbed uh kark father goblin yeah. father of the kark mm -hmm. and sakashima deck this is a deck of your design yeah you were the first person to uh, really like uh, delve into uh like starting to make the discord community and everything surrounding this deck yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I, I certainly wasn't the first brewer and player of the deck, but I probably was the most public early proponent of the deck from a competitive perspective. But yeah, so I, I just was early, you know, I was early on it and I was very high on it early and I thought I saw a lot of potential. And then Wizards of the Coast decided to print like 15 cards that were incredibly good for the deck within the span of six months. And, uh, and we reaped all the benefits and then the deck started performing really well in tournaments all over the world, and it got a lot of attention, uh, both negative and positive. And uh, and yeah, and I think it's a really fun deck to play. I think it's it's very unique um, in Commander's history. It's not unique as a as a manual non-deterministic, and we can talk about what that means later. Storm deck, but it mm. is unique in the fact that you're flipping fucking coins to to do things and that's and you're just doing that a lot so wow, if you Lacoon like to players very much crying in their beds right now oh my god oh you're so right jesus okay okay that's very true but, uh yeah yeah apologies to the okun and, and zinder split pilots i'll say this okay this is better this is the only manual non-deterministic storm deck that relies on flipping more and more coins to increase the odds of casting the same spells over and over again. So if you like casting spells a lot over and over and over again, uh, this deck is probably for you because it pairs the storm mechanic with buyback zero. So yeah. if that sounds fun, give it a shot. Well, you started off uh, talking a little bit about uh, the non-deterministic nature of the deck. Do you want to like yes. start? Let's. I think that seems like a good place to start. Just talk about just like the core of what makes the deck uh, go and work and everything. So yeah, so, what yeah, do we mean by the non-deterministic and uh, manual storm? Yeah. So non-deterministic means that the deck relies on increasing probability to get its job done. It's not like uh, a deck that can find and piece together two card or three card combinations that immediately generate an infinite amount of resources and win you the game on the spot. The deck can fizzle. So during the storm turn, you can be accruing more and more resources with a higher and higher chance of, of in this instance, copying and returning to your hand an instant or sorcery that you want to cast a lot, like a Jessica's Will, for example. But you can get unlucky and everything can fall apart and uh, and you won't win on the spot. So non-deterministic means just that. It means that uh, the, the deck cannot piece together a couple of different cards to immediately <clears throat> generate infinite resources. That, now, there are exceptions to that, right? Uh, there's dual caster twin flame creates an infinite amount of creature tokens with haste. <laughs> that is a two card deterministic infinite combo. Um, but all the other combos are essentially finite in their nature. Um, but the nice thing about probability theory, right, is that um, if you can generate a series of events such that your likelihood of, um, of achieving a certain result increases over time, as you continue to repeat that action and create those events, you can essentially create a condition, and there's a mathematical proof to follow, uh, in which you are able to accrue infinite resources but in a tournament setting in particular uh, this isn't permissible to shortcut you have to play it out because this is a deck that whose loops are um, rely on mathematical 
convergence, re rely on the probability between zero and one, zero meaning it won't happen, and one meaning it definitely does happen, going from 0 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.3 to 0.4 to 0.5 to 0.6, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this chart here shows that convergence towards the probability of one as you flip more coins. And the, pro and the, the line here illustrates the probability of you both copying a spell an instant or sorcery and putting it back in your hand so you can keep going and as you see as you get more quirk triggers that probability slowly uh, converges to one as mm. close to one as is possible given a finite amount of years in the before the heat death of the universe or whatever Nice, yeah, and uh, actually, the, you were having a conversation uh, with a few different people on Twitter the other day, and uh, Braden said this, and I thought this was uh, one of the best ways to put this, because this is this is what really makes this deck a lot of fun for me, is the fact that you can have all your combo pieces in hand, and you, there's still a chance that it might not work out. Uh, yeah. You were saying something to the effect of that it, it, you can essentially uh, put these things through the loops and sort of go for the deterministic wins and sort of just ask people to politely scoop it up if, if they so choose yeah. to in a more casual setting. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, Braden uh, replied... Uh, uh, that in tournament settings, those like 0.4% chances are what makes magic a really, really great game. Just like those very small percentage chances that something either happens or doesn't happen. And it's definitely yeah. I, what makes this deck a lot of fun is just like really riding that edge. Since we, we were talking here, here about increasing our odds uh, with Quark, yeah. let's talk about the engines of the deck and how exactly mm -hmm. we're increasing the amounts of coin flip. So obviously we're starting off by just cloning with Sakashima and getting our additional Quark trigger that way. But let's, let's talk about some of the other uh, creature engines inside of the deck yeah absolutely so uh the primary game plan the game plan that's sitting there in the command zone that the deck sort of wants to do first um if possible is get more kark triggers the old-fashioned way and by that i mean you clone kark with sakashima except that sakashima kark also says hey the legend rule doesn't apply so the legends rule doesn't apply so you can have multiple of the same legendary artifact creature or whatever and then after that, you just play out some clones like Phantasmal Image or Phyrexian Metamorph. Um, that's that's sort of the, the version of the deck that had existed in the beginning. That was the early days, right? We would play cards like Quasi Duplicated. I remember Crackling and, Counterpart was in the main deck. Yeah, yep. yeah. and and that that card, by the way, st I still think it's Some people are still on it because they yeah. like that it's an instant. So they just like sit and hold mm -hmm. up and then untap with like five triggers and you know, it's nice. But um, so that was the that was the name of the game very early on. It was like very very Kirk, then Sakashima, then clones, then win by casting a bunch of spells. But after Modern Horizons two and and uh, Strixhaven um, and Call Time, we got a lot of creature tools that enable us to take a slightly different path. So now uh, there are cards like Harmonic Prodigy and Veyron, which basically say, hey, if you would, uh, you know, if a, a, a triggered ability of a wizard or a shaman you control triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. That's what Harmonic Prodigy says. It's a replacement effect. And Veyron says something similar. It says, if casting or copying an instant or sorcery would cause the triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So another, another replacement effect. So now you have these, these supplements that kind of do what Sakashima as Kark would do anyway, but they're in the main deck. And so you're a little less reliant on the command zone. You're you're a little bit uh, more able to easily rebuild the top decks and other draw engines and stuff. But the primary game plan is get a bunch of Kark triggers so that your odds of both copying an instant or sorcery and putting it back in your hand increase over time. And when you pair that um, with cards like Jessica's Will, which provide both mana and card advantage that's really all you need for a storm deck right storm decks just yeah. want to accrue a ton of resources and then finish it out with uh in what has traditionally been like a storm spell like tendrils of Ab agony or or a grape shot or whatever um and we have those spells here we have grape shot we have um other sources of direct damage like in the festivities and lightning bolt that mm -hmm. you know if you cast them an arbitrary amount of times will kill your opponents um and and then there's also stuff like Brain Freeze, Underworld Breach, so you can mill your opponents out. That's also a great card to storm. Um, and then there are a few other methods uh, of winning, including Dual Caster Twin Flame. But probably the most frequent win con that Kirk Sakashima players report is just casting Twin Flame a bunch. Mm. Um, and you just you essentially just make an arbitrary amount of creature tokens of whatever you got on the board, be it uh, Kark and Sakashima or Harmonic Prodigy or Tavern Scoundrel and a bunch of Karks or whatever. And you swing in with, you know, 
a million tutus with haste or whatever. This is um, what I keep coming to in the playtesting as well, because it's just naturally rewarding you for playing out the things like the Tavern Scoundrel, the Stormkill Nargus that are generating mana along the yep. way while you're casting spells or a Bergy. And the minute you're able to start hitting those as well as your Kark and Sakashima and you're netting mana every single time you're casting them. It, it's the same thing that turns everything in the deck into a single card when gone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my ideal for this list, you know, however many years from now, um, if I'm still alive and playing Magic, is uh, is that no card would be incapable of winning the game if you cast it a bunch. So I would want ideally every single card to win you the game if you cast it, you know, ten thousand times or whatever. And we're getting closer. We're yeah, getting closer the power and closer. Level to cards that. are very high by like twenty twenty six. I could imagine. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there'll be like it'll be like one red mana deal thirty damage, you know, um, and uh, and yeah, it's an instant. We'll have we split creatures that have a thousand attack and defense. That, yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, but yeah, so in the other creature engines, as Dan, as you said, they exist to support their infrastructure for a storm. So they give you more mana when you cast spells a bunch. They draw you cards when you cast spells a bunch. They find. Um, they find cards and uh, benefit from being cloned, like Spellseeker um, and Imperial Recruiter, stuff like that. They reduce your costs, which essentially gets you mana virtually. Um, and then and then the sort of second aspect of this deck, and this is why I call it a mid-range deck, is it can play a very, very strong, frustrating, psychologically taxing and staxing uh, control game hmm. because it turns out when you have an engine that lets you cast you know copy and return spells to your hand free spells and free interactive spells hmm. get real real good so if you have a fierce guardianship in your hand or a submerge uh, suddenly it's extremely oppressive to be able to you know make your three opponents top deck the same creature two turns in a row while you set up a win later on or to counter the same spell or counter a spell from each of your three opponents one two three on the turn cycle and still have the counter spell in your hand when you untap like that's that kind of breaks the rules a little bit of magic you're supposed to the spells are supposed to go away you're not supposed to be able to hold them in your hand and do it up more and more but that is what the deck is designed to do is take advantage of free spells low cost spells spells with alternate costs such that you never have to get rid of them ideally you can always have your cake and eat it too it creates a really interesting atmosphere where your opponents uh, simultaneously like obviously don't want you to have a fluster storm or something in your hand yes. but they don't want to remove it from your hand either because that fluster storm is also representing counters to every single other person at the table so like, yeah it's only really a problem once it gets to your turn but it's a problem the entire time Exactly. It's it really becomes the deck becomes a nice um, what's the word like a nice prism by which people's like greediness is refracted. You know, like you'll <laughs> see the players who are like super angry that you have counter magic. You know that they're just dying to go for it. Kind of consequences be damned. And the players who are like mad but also realize that like having a control table in a pod is often kind of useful. Um, you know, they'll be a little less salty. So it it. Yeah. it it can really reveal a uh, player psychology really well. It also does that just because uh, it's a very stack oriented deck and mm, it creates yeah, yeah. large, large and kind of convoluted and interlocking uh, sets of interactions on the stack. And that can be really tiresome for players. Um, I think primarily just because it's not visual. It's like it's like the hardest element of this game, magic, to, <laughs> to imagine like physically um, and also to deal with and keep track of. So players get really fatigued easy and kind of want to just like, they just want to tap out, you know? They're just like, can I just like cast my two card combo and win already? Like, please stop doing this to me. Um, I also so, have the Cobblepot's method immediately of uh, actually just making uh, cart trigger tokens to be able to put yes. onto the battlefield because that uh, honestly helps helped a lot. me a lot as well. Just exactly. being able to remember exactly where we're at. Yeah, you want, and and I and that's that's why I recommend here, and I recommend it in the video I just put out. You want to be able to visually represent what you're up to, both for your own sake, but for your opponent's sake, because you know that you will have more fun if your opponents are also enjoying themselves. And yes. anything you can do to kind of help them understand what the stack looks like and when to interact and stuff, that that's going to help you in the long term. Yeah, you know, I don't don't try to be sneaky and fool your opponents in that way, like be honest say what the stack is don't you know just like play the game just like have fun yeah, playing exactly the game, there's no you know? satisfaction to be gained from like uh 
you know, pulling one over on your opponent. Quark is good enough uh, that you don't have to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you I mean, that's the, don't yes. need to manipulate anyone. The deck will just manipulate no. everybody for you. It seems exactly. like a deck that forces you into a, a sort of political uh, atmosphere uh, more often than not, because you do need to sort of make your claim sort of that, like, the Flusterstorm is important in my hand, and, uh, like, getting rid of something else more than a Quark is probably the correct decision in certain scenarios, even if the Quark is going to make your life a living hell. It's true. It, I think that you know the fun. The fun part about Commander is that it's it's we can talk and and mm -hmm. negotiate. Like that's that's just a fun aspect of the game. I know some not everybody loves doing it, but it is there for you if you want to, um, and you feel capable of doing it. And it definitely is a deck that um, pol politicking well really serves your purposes because as a mid range deck, right, as a deck that wants to control the game a little bit and then play value generating creatures and then win right with an abundance of resources that's sort of the archetypal mid-range um strategy you have to make sure that that early game which you know sometimes means turn turns one through three that that early game you do not appear to be the most threatening engine at the table because yeah. it is an engine deck right that's mm -hmm. that's how it wins it assembles a little complicated engine then runs it runs it runs it um but it is important, I think, to to try to guide people's attention to the possibilities that the other decks present. You know, I, uh, something I say a lot, and I do mean this, and and I know that sometimes people believe it, sometimes people don't. Um, but it is true, whether you believe it or not, is that this deck does not have Thoracle Console. Mm. It, it doesn't have a two card, three mana or four mana combination that just wins the game. Um, it, it does have a two card or really three card because you need to control a creature, uh, five mana combo yeah. that wins the game, right? But it has many more points of interaction, dual caster, twin flame. It's yes. it's hard, It's much easier to disrupt than Thoracle Console. Just the fact that it has a board dependence is like, you know, puts it in a different league than Thoracle Console. Exactly. You need, you, you like, it can win out of nowhere, it can be explosive, but it does require, yeah, building up a board. And so I just try to remind opponents that, like, we don't, we don't have access to black, right? So we don't have unconditional tutors. Um, and we can't win at literally out of the blue with three mana. Um, and so just keep that in mind, you know, and you know, some people, people have learned as time progresses that like, yes, that is true, but they still understand that the deck can be explosive and is a threat. Um, yeah. but That's I, I do think this exists and it can like absolutely push the envelope exactly. and give you everything you need. Exactly. It's very silly, that card. Um, but again, I, this is why I like to make an analogy to like the Advantage Thrasios list of old, where you've got your commander, you have another creature, uh, and then an engine presents itself, right? You have Thrasios, mm -hmm. you have Seaborn Muse, and, and maybe Training Grounds or something. And that is an engine. It, it runs and accrues, you know, heightens your velocity as time, increases your velocity as time goes on, gives you more power. Um, and that's what this do deck does too. It has an engine. The engine just happens to be in the command zone, which is really, really nice. And uh, and it wants to run and protect itself for a little bit and then win with uh, an overabundance of resources. The only difference is that, yeah, we're not Seedborn musing, Thrasiosing in a Timna shell into Lab Man back in the day or Thoracle Consult. You gotta kind of piece it together. It's, it could be a little bit more complicated um, you have to you have to pay more attention, I think, to the opportunities that present themselves when you're storming off. Mm, yeah. Uh, just quickly, we had a, a single person AMA from Time of the Oddball. I'm just going to ask everybody, uh, we, we're going to do a Q&A uh, at the end. So if you got any questions, make sure you write them down or anything like that. And we're going to we're going to devote some time at the end to doing some some direct Q&As at the end. Uh, but Ken, we've talked about uh, the engine a little bit now. Let's talk about uh, the gas lane we're putting in the engine. What are yes. uh, let, let's talk about, I guess, like early game uh gas that we're looking for in terms of like starting the game opening hand first couple of turns what are some of like your favorite cards to kind of see once we have got maybe just like one quark on the battlefield yeah yeah okay so a one quark situation more and more and particularly as people get hip to the deck and understand what it does I like to, you know, this is what we, what we Quark players like to refer to as a disturbingly as a naked Quark, right? This is just this is just Quark on his uh, by is his Quark wearing himself. clothes. Hold on, barely. I need to answer this question. Barely any, barely any. He's wearing um, a necklace. I don't know if that counts. <laughs> I don't think a, a necklace is clothes. Maybe a necklace is clothes. Um, but so in a naked Quark situation where you can, when you have just one Quark trigger, mm -hmm. ideally. 
in my mind, you want bit high risk, high reward. Okay. And and what that looks like usually, right, is Jessica's will. Like I think that 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 is sort of the dex ad nauseum. You want you can yeah. cast Jessica's will over and over again if you have a couple quirk triggers and and it helps you find more resources, particularly since the deck leans into red and has a lot of enablers and action in red. Um, so a, a YOLO Jessica's will into a naked Krark, that's quite a sentence. Are we um, avoiding naked Krark scenarios? Are we just trying to avoid using any of our action spells? Uh, for Is that like we're backed into a corner and that's why we're gonna do this pretty much? No, I I have come to really love the YOLO Jessica's will or, oh God, that's an alarm. Um, or the YOLO frantic search or whatever, the high mm. mana value, in other words, like three plus yeah. I spells I mean, something like frantic list. search, it seems like the things that generate mana like frantic search and yes. Jessica's will, like those are really worth it to try to go for the proc because that can just set you up to the place where you can cast the Sakashima and then start going off from there. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah, you want to you wanna be able to rapidly accrue a lot more resources than your opponents can accrue. And mm -hmm. and 50-50, right? A 50-50 chance to do that, to, in my mind, that's a great chance. Like, I'll take that gamble all day. Um, and then eventually, that 50-50 chance becomes 75-50 or, um, you know, or more, 80, 86, 93, 98%, you know, that you get to have your cake and eat it too. But I find that early enablers in the form of, or early Kark supplements in the form of Harmonic Prodigy, or Veyron, or Archmage Emeritus, or Stormkiln Artist, or Tavern Scoundrel, um, right? The, the cards that, or Bergy, the cards that generate you resources when you're just going about your life, casting instants or sorceries anyway, those are, those are what you want to look for. Yeah. Um, and the then, best thing is they're all red too. Like the fact that oh, all the rituals are just gonna be able to pump you into like a harmonic prodigy or Bergy feels really, yep. really good. And it seems like one of the things that the deck used to be missing. Yep, yep, exactly. So, you know, Jessica's wills have never been more profitable um, because a lot of times it's just like, okay, I find my mana fixing off it and I find a source to draw cards and all right, we'll just keep, you know, spinning the wheels. Um, so I would say early rituals are real good and early enablers are real good or something that you know play pattern that i play quite a bit i always i always generally shoot for a turn one kark particularly because you want to you want to get it out before Dranith lands ideally um uh is control right it's just to have a couple pieces of interaction and ideally free ones because one kark and control is kind of a risky gambit you don't want to untap or you don't want to pass a turn with like three man two mana up or three mana up for instance and like have a swan song in your hand, like yes, that is three chances at two swan songs, and that's pretty good, right? Again, mm -hmm. I'll take those odds, but you, it can be kind of disastrous when you have just one Kark trigger. It can, if it can feel really bad to try to spend. Oh wow, thank you. Not just, not just amazing. Um, it can feel really, it. really bad to spend three mana attempting to resolve one copy or two copies of a gamble or whatever. Um, that's why ideally you want to start going for it when you have two plus Kark triggers and really the, the world is your oyster usually when you have um, three plus Kark triggers. Um, that said, you know, the deck is an engine deck, but it does have other means of doing the thing. It, it plays card advantage engines like Fish and Mystic Remore, or like mm -hmm. Mystic Remore and Ristic Study. And, and again, like Archmage Emeritus and stuff. It has Mind's Desire. Sometimes you can just kind of, without Kark, just be like, well, I'm just gonna, cast a ritual and a, a couple mana rocks and a piece of interaction and sneak into Mind's Desire and like see what happens. Like yeah. that happens sometimes too, or a big brain freeze. That was the range like, plan. I remember that being in the yeah. cast primer. You, if, it said something along the lines of, if you cast six spells and then cast Mind's Desire, you should win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, one can hope, right? And I mean, it's kind of correct. <laughs> It's kind of correct. It's a little bit harder in a deck where you don't have access to black because yes. again, it's like, eh, it's like you really do have to see what you flip. The Grixis um, is notably different, but uh, oh yeah, Mines Desire Grixis for six is real good. It's a good deal. Yeah, Mines Desire for six is fantastic. Um, and and a play pattern that you'll see with this deck too a lot of times is is you you know sometimes you can just kind of hang back and play control, right? Because it, it runs a lot of disruption. It's got twenty ish mm -hmm. pieces of disruption, um, which is. Uh, increasingly I think quite quite a bit for most decks um, and particularly since the engine lets you 
oftentimes get two plus copies of them or reuse them, recycle them. Um, so the deck can play control pretty well. And uh, and then again, go for the mid-range plan. Find your little value generating creatures that sneak under the miscasts and spell pierces and swan songs of the world, you know, that only get got by hard counter spells and, and exile effects and then sneak them out. And again, start the engine rolling again. Try to get it back online, try to rebuild the car and roll down the hill and crank the ignition. Okay, so let's talk about then, like, maybe next step of the game plan. Now we've got second Sakashima. Maybe we've got uh, one of our, our engines online. Uh, uh, we're, we're making mana. We're doubling our spells. Mm -hmm. What are we looking for with, like, a spell seeker or something like that? We're looking towards moving to close the game out. Yeah, so if you've got the engine online, um, you can go one of two ways. You can do what I usually do and kind of overshoot, shoot for quantity mm -hmm. over quality. And that means like really make sure that you have a Scrooge McDuck level abundance yeah. of riches and then try to win. Or you can just kind of try to be efficient and like just, just find the easiest thing and go for it. But I find that it's better to overshoot than undershoot. Cause if you undershoot yes. and fizzle, the target is on your back. Mm -hmm. everybody's going to do all they can to disrupt you. If you overshoot and fizzle, you're going to pass the turn discarding the hand size with seven pieces, you know, five pieces of protection and two win cons and your engine's still online. So I think overshoot, go for quantity. And what that means is accrue more mana and more cards in hand or more yeah. cards in your grave if you're going for breach. I more, think there's a more... tendency to sort of be polite and maybe not like... Yeah oh, I'm not going to try to sit here and farm strike it, Rich, as much as I can over the next yeah. five minutes before I go for the win. But as a Storm player, you really should every single time. There's no reason yes. not to. Like, I know it's, like, more polite to save the, your opponents a little bit of time. But, you know, just be efficient about the way that you're casting it. And you really just, you're always going to want the extra resources. There's no situation in which you're going to end a game winning and be like, darn, I had too much mana. I wish I hadn't yeah. farmed that strike it, Rich. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, you know, it do, it is it does rely on manual dexterity, right? So it, it there are it's, it does have its limitations in terms of time. But um you know, I I released a video just about this kind of showing how I keep track of resources, how I try to move quickly through a storm turn and that that can maybe give you some ideas, but which is going to yeah, be linked oh, in the card right above for YouTube viewers. Oh, sick. Nice. Love that. But I think I think overshoot, right? And then once you have a ton of cards in your hand, including some, hopefully some free disruption that you can use to protect yourself. Although at this point, to be honest, if your opponents haven't interrupted you, you know, they've lost anyway. But um, shoot for a bunch of cards in hand, a bunch of floating mana. And then um, again, you can go one of a few different ways. You can go for a breach freeze win. You can go for a dual caster twin flame. You can go for a twin flame plus on Quark's Oxygen or on Sokka Quark plus a mana producer and go back and forth to make, you know, increase your odds of copying and returning and then keep paying for the Twin Flame or netting mana that way. Um, you can go for just manually lighting, lightning bolting or grape shotting or in the festivities, ing people to death. Um, that can be really fun, particularly if you like do it at instant speed over the top of somebody else's win, kill them with lightning bolt, spy, you get, you get immediate style points and uh, you immediately, you know, get, get a nice like gravestone in the nicest cemetery in your town and get into heaven. It just, it just works that way. It's in the Bible. Just look it up. Um, and, uh, and yeah, in the festivities is incredible. And yeah, so I think, I think, you know, the, the, the means of winning are pretty free. Like there are a lot of cards that can win the game if you cast them a bunch in the list, just shoot for quantity. That would be my primary principle, just to crew a ton of resources. Let's talk about try some to, of the try weird to do it swiftly. win con sort of things in the list. Like Tybalt's Trickery, I think, is something that naturally you would look at and just see it as a win con. But like, yep. this is a, or, or not, I'm sorry, not see it as a win con, but see it as a counter spell. But this is like a win con in and of itself. Yes. Yeah, Tybalt's Trickery, I count it in my mind as card draw. I, I And I think okay. even in the primer, let me double check that this is the case. But I think even in the primer, I have it categorized as card draw. I do. I categorize it as card draw because that's primarily what it is for this it's deck. It is not advantage. Yeah, it is card advantage because what you want to do with it is counter your own spells. Because they that doing so allows you to reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal non uh, non land card and cast that. So ideally, you counter a superfluous spell in the stack, be it a copy of Fluster Storm or a Strike of Rich that you don't care if it resolves or whatever. You counter a trickery. Trickery mills you a little bit, so hopefully fills fills you up for breach later on. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and invoke calamity, and then hopefully send you into more action that you then cast and get more crook triggers. And then if you've cast it off trickery and you lose a flip, it goes right back to your hand. So it's card advantage that way. You're, you're, you're pulling cards out of your deck and putting them in your hand and increasing the odds of getting their effects off to, you know, copying them. Um, so trickery is, is just a mono red way to convert dead spells into live spells. Mm. And again, the fact that it's mono red and you can generate like the Bergy mana to be able to start recasting it and things like that, th those spells seem yep. to have like a huge amount of value. Uh, the shout out to Invoke Calamity. Yes, Invoke Calamity. I saw that in the chat too. That card, um, I think people were initially a little bit skeptical on it because it was like, man, one red, 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 like, mm. ouch, you know, that seems like Finale of Promise was in that same spot, which is just mm -hmm. X red, red. It could, you could cast it so much lower to the ground, you could spell seeker for it. But the, the man, the reports about Invoke Calamity are truly bonkers. Like, this card is ridiculous. The Every fact time that it, it comes says, up in testing, it's amazing for me. Oh, oh my God. It's insane. The fact that it says graveyard and or hand is just nuts. That means that not only are you going to recur stuff that you need, uh, and then the stuff you cast, by the way, the instance or sorcerers you cast will trigger your Krarks. But you can also, with a copy of Invoke Calamity, if Calamity is in your graveyard from having been countered or in your hand from having lost a flip, when the copy of an Invoke Calamity resolves, you can cast Invoke Calamity off your Invoke Calamity copy. So you cast Invoke and then you, inca you cast another instant or sorcery and you just keep going. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really, it's like a, it is a very self-sustaining card, uh, kind of like Tibble's Trickery in that way, where it can interact with itself with just one or two more inputs and 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 generate a win that way and it's an instant like that was the huge limitation yeah. of finale i promise like the fact that you can use and invoke calamity and just kind of yolo it out uh and try to win on top of somebody now it enables like a huge set of new lines like really like that it, it does open up the entire deck uh hmm. to an instant speed win now on top of yeah. other people where that wasn't the case before we had more narrower options before and again, it's all red. It's color fixing too. Like the the fact that you can also use this to cast an intuition if you're only able to make red mana off of uh, the Bergy or whatever it is. Uh, yep. The fact that this is so versatile, uh, the, and, and all of the slots are starting to get like this, uh, like invoke cal calamity levels of just like really good flexibility, really good possibilities. Like it's a, it, it would be impossible for us to sit here and list all of the ways in which you could use invoke calamity to win a game because certainly uh, the, just look at the entire deck. We haven't, yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't. <laughs> it all yet there's no computer that can see all of the simulations of life <laughs> yeah i mean invoke calamity just says um uh you know total mana value six or less so just keep that in mind like if you can pick two instances of sorceries and add them up to six any two combinations or just say screw it and cast mind's desire off it get the storm trigger and keep going um you know it's it's very yeah it's very very silly are there any other um sort of maybe non-traditional win cons that you uh want to talk about in the deck Maybe something that's think, like not so obvious. Yeah, I think that um, you know this line hasn't really come up for me very much, but it is possible, um, and particularly with invoke calamity and breach and stuff, is like if you need to swan song a bunch of spells and uh, swing in with them the next turn or twin flame them all, you can. Um, mm. You can just you know make a big sack, and then if your engine's spinning, you can just counter split stuff and make a two two each time. That, that's there. It's not going to be a primary way you win, but it is in your back pocket in case you like get a bunch of your deck exiled or something or you know get milled out and don't have access to Breach anymore and you're like, oh no, how do I get there? The nice thing about this deck is it is so layered in terms of the fact that it turns out when you let a Magic player cast any given instant or sorcery an arbitrary amount of times, it turns out a lot of them can win the game. Yeah. So you, you really do not suffer if you get milled out quite a bit, you know, not entirely, but if you get milled a bunch or if you get Praetors grasped, like literally none There's of that nothing matters. nothing you could grasp out of this deck that would stop no. it from winning. <laughs> literally nothing that you, there are, I think I did the count one time in terms of like, okay, really legitimately, how many cards would need to be, how many cards would need to get got for you to have mm -hmm. no chance of winning realistically? It was like 15 cards or something. All right, so, so a sadistic sacrament and you're fucked. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, yep. CDH staple sadistic sacrament. Yeah. If if you get hit by it, just scoop it up. Um, but yeah, you gotta it's know really what the 15 it's really cards so Yeah, yeah, they got to get it a hundred percent right. Exactly. Um, 
But I think the 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 most common win con isn't the most obvious to people, I'd say, reading the primer or piloting the deck for the first time, and that is it's going to be Twin Flame yeah. slash Heat Shimmer lines. Like, yes, Dual Caster Twin Flame's there. That's, to be honest, that's sort of just there for expediency because it's it's efficient and it doesn't I, require much startup. Yeah. But the Palladium you're not, is honestly very nice. Yeah, exactly. So if you, like, flip a big Jessica's Will pile and you've got access to those two cards, just be like, okay, like, y'all is this good like or can y'all interact with this or should i keep going um it is it is a nice nice thing and dual caster can be sneaky sometimes you can copy a peer or something i like dual caster a yeah. lot yeah i think yeah, it's a, this is it's like a fun card close to corval and its levels of just like this is almost a win con list deck there are some like there are some actual ish win con things like grape shot is like a pretty hard win con but it yeah. is almost completely devoid of any one card that just wins the game you just sort of incidentally do it with value and again to go back to our conversation of just always overshoot it you always yeah. that's what you're always trying to do is just reach critical mass of everything yes exactly and and then i would say another not so obvious win con but very important to pay attention to is um harmonic prodigy veyron and storm kiln artist they mm. can become quite large um and so Sometimes you can just, even if you kind of spin out and fail to keep accruing uh, card advantage in a turn that you're trying to storm off, if you just look down um, at the, you know, the, the the D20s you've been spinning up each time you cast or copy an instant or sorcery on Veyron, it will probably show you 20 to 40 power on that thing. For anyone so, not looking directly at the card right now, Harmonic Prodigy has literal prowess, Veyron has a, a weird sort of prowess, and uh, Storm Kiln gets bigger with the amount of artifacts that you have. Exactly. And and for a commonly asked question is, hey, does Veyron see its own Magecraft trigger? Yes, it does. So it gets two. So you cast your copy and instant sorcery, it gets um, plus two, plus two. Um, or rather, I think, yes. Is that, let me let me double check. Let me make sure my math is correct. I, I believe that's, that's true, but let me just double check. Yes, so cast your copy and instant sorcery plus two plus two. So, you know, cast a grape shot, storm count nine. Hey, plus 18 plus 18 on a on a beater ain't nothing to shake a stick at. Um, very, and, very nice. and, and going back to Twin Flame Heat Shimmer, mm -hmm. if you're like, oh man, like if I just had like 80 damage right now, I'd win. Just, 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 I you know, frame. yeah, just, just Twin Flame. Just Twin Flame, a, a big old Veyron or a big old Harmonic Prodigy or Storm Kiln Artist and like, Sometimes you can just kind of sneak out a win that way. I mm. I won a game not not too long ago um, playing against an Umbris deck. Right, Umbris gets real big real fast. Um, and uh, Mab, my opponent, had a 22-22 uh, Umbris, and I just managed to just heat shimmer it and copy it and untap with two real big Umbrises. And it's like okay, like sometimes it's just there. Other people's stuff is often your stuff. Um, you just have to pay attention to the texture of the board. And, um, but yeah, again, the deck does not suffer for win conditions. It is very, very densely redundant. So don't worry too much about what you'll spin into. You'll spin into something most of the time. It's also a deck that seems to be filled with, uh, while it doesn't really have any win cons, it does have a lot of spells that seem to be threatening uh, on their exterior. And when people want to spend a counter on them, it's like, yeah, totally, excellent, yes, do yes. that. And I yep. will cast this other haymaker that I have in my hand, <laughs> and that will be just okay. It is really beautiful to watch people freak out and counter a Gataxian probe, you know? Mm. Like, that's just like, this deck will create those situations in a way that no other deck will. Like, people will. Gr will be like, oh my god, we have to counter that ponder. When yes. do you ever yeah, hear yeah. that? You know I, I, mean? I had so. someone the other night very concerned over uh, Overmaster, and they were like, oh, well, the next spell is going to be uncounterable. It's like, uh, the next spell is going to be Overmaster again. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, the snap exactly. in my hand that's going to kill you. <laughs> bingo, bingo, exactly. So it, it can be very confusing um, to opponents that way. But yeah, I think that I say something in my primer about this is like the deck creates virtual card advantage by way of making opponents counter seemingly innocuous like one to two mana mm. value cantrips and like tiny spells because no other deck people will not do that in other decks, but they will here um, yeah. because so so that that's that's card advantage too, right? Even if they spend whatever, if they, even if they spend one mana to counter your one mana spell, if you if the one manner spell they're countering is a cantrip, and they're spending a fluster storm on it, you have won that card advantage battle, um, just by nature of the fact that you know you have a dime a dozen effects like that, 
and uh, their efficient interruption is going to come at a premium because they can't recycle it like we can and, and continue to use it. Yeah, not to mention that like any time that interaction is being used, there's still probably a quirk trigger on the stack and we may, may still be getting value out of the spell, even if it is countered. Exactly. Or Opponents are more value out of it than it, we're already getting for having interaction spent. Exactly. Opponents will often correctly counter, and this is correct in, in most instances, I think, counter the original spell in mm -hmm. response to any of the triggers, you know, that you put on the, stop, the stack, Magecraft, Bergy, uh, Kark triggers, whatever. And that's smart because you want to stop the Kark player from continuing to cast it, so just getting it off the stack yeah. will do. But again, yeah, you got some flips. So if you spend two life to cast a taxi probe with two Kark triggers, somebody counters it, and then you resolve two copies, you've spent two life to play a spell that says draw two cards, look at two players' hands, and an opponent uses one of their disruption spells against you. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good rate. Um, I think that that card would be banned in every constructive format <laughs> in which it was printed. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is know. it pushes the value of everything over the top. Like if you counter my Jessica's will and I still get two copies of Jessica's will anyway, I probably have won the game. Yep, exactly. Yeah, you're you're really you're really going to be OK. And but again, no, if you're new to this deck, you can't get lucky. And that's why I think that there, there's a sort of like weird philosophical attitude that pops up in Kark players where you just sort of yield yourself to the fact that like Kark will sometimes own you and humiliate you. Yes. And and that and, and that's OK. That's like the fun of sure. it, just like gambling, right? Like you gambling is fun because you could lose it's not fun because you win all the time it's fun because there's always the possibility that things could go horribly wrong um and so Kark can Kark can make you fizzle Kark can you know prevent your counter spell that would save save everybody from losing Kark can say eh, no thanks like put it back in your hand you're not getting that today but at the same time that same card which is sometimes self staxy is also the card that gets you 10 mana and six cards off of Jessica's will on turn two, yeah. whatever, you know? And exactly in the chat here, right? Uh, in the immortal words of Zen Hu from who's, uh, who's in the Thumbless Discord quote, and this is a straight quotation, I've achieved inner Kirk peace by abandoning all logic. My agency in the outcome of CDH games is indistinguishable from zero. Uh, Zen Hu notoriously, um, rips blind sevens off the top, keeps them without even looking them, at them. And then also when resolving intuition, copies of intuition, will just take three random cards from the deck and present them as an intuition pile. Truly an enlightened, an enlightened uh, uh, freak in the fun crook. Put a very heavy emphasis on the Zen in their name, for sure, yeah. That, but exactly. honestly though, it just speaks to what this deck is and does. Sure, you'll lose some gains to your blind sevens, but like all of the spells are good too. All the spells do the same thing. They either make mana or they draw cards. <laughs> Exactly. So it's like, eh, you know, the deck that because, and I think that that's a that is a hidden, underexplored benefit of playing decks that are in low um, color amounts that also lack access to black because you need to play more redundant effects because you don't have black tutors, which you know are the second version of any card that you want. So you do need more redundancy. You do need more overlap, and that is not necessarily a bad thing, you know, because it is a lot harder to get blown totally out. It's a lot harder to be without an out. You almost always have an out playing this deck um, as long as you can just keep drawing cards. Uh, so, you know, there are benefits to being in a two color deck mm. with a lot of duplicates effects. You know, it's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think tournament results have shown that can even be a good thing. It can even prey on certain open spots and other people's thinking about the deck and then prey on certain sort of game mechanical situations too. In the conversation of uh, fighting other decks, what are your what are your philosophies on sort of how you attack other people in terms of more aggressive spells like lightning bolt or more reactive spells like uh, counters and things like that? Is there any sort of um, uh, any sort of heuristics in the way that you will either hold counters or hold interaction? Or are we always like looking for critical mass point before we're spending any resources? Or uh, mm. just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's a real hard thing to have a rule of thumb for, pun intended, because, um, you know, every pod composition is going to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And every uh, every deck, the tempo is, is you know, is always going to be a little bit unique. Um, but I'd say that I feel pretty comfortable at this point in the deck's construction. Um, I can be pretty comfortable burning 
disruption early and just being like, hey, if I have a single Kirk and I have a Fierce Guardianship in my hand and somebody's whatever, going for uh, a Vamp Tutor that I know is gonna find a creature for a creature combo, I'll just throw it out there because at worst, right, um, the, the worst case situation is in response to the Kirk trigger, somebody counters it and then you lose the flip, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But that's the worst case situation that is still removed a piece of disruption from the opponent's hand who's going for it. That's not a bad thing. It's like an instant speed thought seize or whatever. Um, the best situation is you win the flip and then suddenly an opponent's gonna try to climb over two fierce guardianships. And to be honest, it almost never happens. Like what any, that's the nice thing about this deck in a multiplayer format. At any given time, it is very rare for somebody to have a, like multiple pieces of protection when they go for it. Usually they'll have one. Sometimes they have two and that's great. Responsible players, clap, 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 very nice. But to be able to put two pieces of disruption on the stack for free at instant speed with a lot of these spells in the deck, um, or for free and or spells that like net you mana, like snap or whatever, if they copy. To be able to do that as one player is very asymmetrical. Because usually what you see when somebody goes for it and, and they need to use the protection they have as a backup is they'll have one piece, or if they have two, they'll be combated by a couple different players, right? So there's, uh, there's so often somebody's like sandbagging interaction, they're just waiting, 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 and then they sneak out the force negation that they've been sitting on knowing that, you know, priority would get back around to them. Or, you know, there's usually a player like that, or there are a couple players with counter spell up and they're just happy to burn them. But you can serve the role as sort of like two players um, with your mm -hmm. control elements. So use them early. I think that's totally fine. And particularly if you're going against really aggressive decks that can can win faster than you. Like mm -hmm. if you're going against Turbo Nas, Turbo Nas is at minimum a turn faster than this deck. At minimum, um, usually. And so you see interaction. Don't worry about it. There are more pieces of disruption. The deck, again, has 20 pieces of disruption in it which combined with the engine can usually mean like 30-ish pieces of inter uh, interaction in a game. That's absurd. No, you know, no other deck plays that much disruption in the entire CDH DDB. Like, so use your interaction. Don't be, don't be afraid. Don't feel like you have to hold it mm. to go off because a lot of times during your storm turn, all it takes to find everything you need is just like a cantrip, you know, or a copy of Jessica's Will. And then suddenly, hey, I've got 10 red mana and three blue mana floating, and now suddenly I have access to two counter spells that are sitting there, and both of them are free. You know, and so you yeah. will, you can you can often piece together the interaction, but I'd say, you know, worry about stopping the faster decks, be they Turbo Nas or like Stick Fingers, you know, something like super linear and commander centric. Worry about stopping them, um, or ideally, trust that the pod collectively will understand that they need to be stopped first mulligan appropriately and then go for it second because <laughs> that's like mm. it's like that's like so many free wins this deck can catch so many free wins because when it attempts to go second it usually attempts to go second with at least two pieces of interaction because a lot of it's free and Kark will copy it and nobody after you know fighting over a Nas nobody single-handedly is going to be able to deal with that. So that your your ideally position to go off after Nas has gotten blown out, or, you know, if somebody has gone for it in another way and they've drawn out a lot of, they've sponged a lot of interaction. But um, but also know that sometimes you are the beatdown, right? You're the fastest deck at the table and just lean into it. And then you mulligan for Storm. Don't mulligan for Control. Um, don't worry about that. Just go Burr. Just, just accrue resources as fast as you possibly can. Don't worry too much about getting interrupted because the worst case scenario is you get big rifted or you get toxic deluged or you get um, pyroclasmed and a bunch of your tutus die. Here's the nice thing about this deck. Your commander is a two mana value commander. I, I, there are so many games that I've won having recasted Kark for four mana, six mana, eight mana because it's a storm deck. Generating eight mana on turn six is not going to be that big of a deal in many instances. You because again, so casting it twice, not very difficult. Exactly, exactly. So don't worry about you know your creatures getting removed too much. You have a very mana efficient engine in your command zone, and you always have access to the command zone unless you get toxic deluge wipe all the creatures off your board and then a Dranith Magistrate comes out and then another Dranith Magistrate comes out, you know, like, and then a rule law or whatever. But if you get, you, you know, you've lost if you get 
stack stout anyway. Um, but again, but, though, the density of interaction in the deck makes it really possible for you to come back from those situations. I was telling you, uh, my first yep. game with Kark and Sakashima was immediately a, a two Dranith Magistrate game. I just went runner runner on uh, pieces to get them off the table and uh, started putting <laughs> it together. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's it does run a lot of disruption and uh, and know too that Kark. I think this is this is still not quite understood very thoroughly by Stax players. I think they don't want to believe it until they see it, um, and then by then it's too late, which is great. Um, is that Kurt can break parity on Stax pieces too? Yes. You know, it's yeah, not yeah. just the Stax piece. It's not just the Stax player that's doing it because if you have free interaction that you can cast and copy, suddenly, hey, guess what? A rule law kind of works in your favor if you can cast your guardianship two or three times. You know and like and copy it and return it to your hand or if on the eot right you're about to untap and oh man there are two stacks pieces on the board huh there's a creature and uh, there's an enchantment damn what am i going to do about that uh well you just need a bounce spell at instant speed to copy and then congratulations you've unlocked both stacks pieces and you're untapping so it's like the the crark the crark thing really does work in those situations where you know, flip a coin. If you call, if you win the flip, you win the game. That that just happens a lot of times. I remember this being the philosophy of uh, a lot of Grixis deck pick, picking up uh, Rushing River for a little while, a common from Plane Shift, I want to say. Yeah, I remember that. It bounces a permanent and has a, uh, a kicker sacrifice a land yep. to, to uh, bounce a second one. And the philosophy being that the, at most points, the things that are stacking you out is just like two permanents that are really keeping exactly. you from winning any, any one game. And yep. I mean, obviously, Quark doubling up your snaps is uh, is your rushing river in a shell. Yeah, exactly. And you don't have to pay three mana and sacrifice a permanent to do it. You get to net two mana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the reason actually why I went off is because it, it ate into the rain of filth mana. So. Uh, oh wow, yeah. Yeah. I was I was always a little skeptical of that seeing play when it when it started to come in. I mean, I understood the logic of it, but I was just like, man, that's like, yeah, it's. It bounces everything, but it's three mana, and then you're down, you're down, down one mana in decks that don't run as many rituals. Like it's a little tough, even with like the Mox Opals of the world. Like eh, it seems a little sketchy to me, but yeah, I like I like playing a deck where sure. exactly I like a deck where quantity is the name of the game. Like I I'm too dumb to play decks that to be honest, like playing decks with access to black, it's difficult for me. Because I'm too dumb to be like, oh man, I can I can do any card in my deck right now. Okay, what's the best card? I'm too dumb to answer that question. I just yeah. monkey brain. I want to just like you more. To, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please, please. I was gonna say it, it definitely it pushes you to go as quickly as possible and try to piece things together as quickly as possible. Where a deck like this, um, it is just an absolute abundance of mana at every single pass. It's one thing I've noticed in playtesting and things is that uh, you're in storm so often mana is your bottleneck, but it very rarely seems to be the bottleneck for this deck. Yeah, and particularly red mana. And I think you know, ideally, if Wizards keeps doing what they're doing, God bless them. Um, more and more interaction will be red, you know. So if we can, if we can slowly lean the deck more red as time progresses, and we already have in the last year, like that's already happened. Um, that would be for the best, you know. And and all the treasure stuff, uh, despite your thoughts about it, it's going to keep coming probably. <laughs> and so, uh, Sorry, Cal. and so yeah, I know. And so like, hey, that's that's good. That's real good for us. We love treasure tokens in yeah. dark decks. We love them. They're great. Um, and now Treasonous Ogre is main deck and. Uh, yeah, it feels really good to just be like, huh, well, all I need is nine red mana right now, and I can cast Kark and cast a Jeska's Will, and, uh, or, you know, 12 mana or whatever, um, or 12 life. I'll mm, cast yeah. Kark, I'll cast a Jeska's Will. If I fail, who cares? Pay nine more life, try it again, and then piece together a win that way. So it, it b both helps with rebuilding, but it also helps with super early, aggressive, mana intensity yolo crark go for it turns um, it's almost like dockside extortionist in terms of his acceleration uh like obviously it's not nearly as good um yes but like you said you can keep refueling it just with your life total but it's just the same thing where you are just able to play this one card and then start fueling out okay well here's crark and then here is strike it rich and i'm going to double that up and now cast sakashima and now we're casting other spells and we're off to exactly 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 yep exactly
Um, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything in particular we need to talk about with artifacts. Um, one thing I, I did know, obviously, that there is no is it signet in this list, and I assume that has to yep. do with just like velocity issues and the way that it helps you cast a turn one Krark. Yeah, um, I am typically not, and this probably isn't just my prejudice as a brewer, but it seems like it's reflected in a lot of places. I'm not the only one thinking this, but I'm typically off the signets, um, even in a two color deck. Uh, I mean, uh, off the off the filter signets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I really like the talismans, and I really like arcane signet because they cost um, they cost one. It's not yeah. the case for the signets, you know. So, like the fact that during a storm turn you can immediately tap it for blue, which is usually what you're looking for, um, is very very nice. And yes, you know, it, signet does that too, but it costs one more mana. Um, yeah, it's and, not like where you can essentially cast it for one mana with Bergy and then immediately start using it to generate mana. Exactly. So I, I don't love it. I've always liked the talismans in that spot and not signet. But some people are on it and it's fine. Like it, it, it can absolutely do the job that it is <laughs> needed to be done. But I do prefer stuff that really helps you get those early Kark and Sakshima. Like the ideal curve for the deck in most instances, assuming no Harmonic Prodigy or Veyron in hand, um, is turn one Kark, turn two Sakashima, turn three, start spinning the wheels and going for it. Um, and so, yeah, any rock that can get you there, I think has to be prioritized. Mm. And, uh, Quark's thumb, what's that about? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Quark's thumb being played competitively in a CDH deck in the year of our Lord 2022. What a world. Um, Quark's thumb is just, uh, from, you know, the D and D players. You don't actually are, have to answer that question, but you can, if you want to. It just basically, it helps you pick the pick the result you want when you're flipping coins. And that can be really nice. It can smooth out a turn. It's not yeah. it's not as good as more triggers in many circumstances. Usually more triggers is the line you want to go for. It helps out the but, though, like. Oh my God, lot. so much, so much. Like statistically, it is very, very extremely useful in the first, within the first like three trigger span. So yeah, it's definitely it, one it's, of those things that it helps color to, to uh, bridge you. Yeah, especially being able to cast it off like a mana crypt or something like that. It definitely helps you to bridge that gap between the naked Kark to the three Kark uh, state of the game. Yep, exactly. Yep, yep. Um, is there anything that you want to talk about in terms of uh, mana base at all? No, I mean, I think the mana base is pretty straightforward. Like, Odawara is in there now, and it's it's good. You know, it's got, a, got a, a little The Shatter Skull utility. Smashing as our 28th. Yeah, Shatter Like, we're on 28, and that, for some folks, can seem a little bit greedy, and I agree. It is. I thought but about again, cutting it down to 27 TBH. You, could, you can. I mean, that's the thing. It's a Storm deck. It has 20 pe 21 pieces of ramp. So you can probably go up. You go down to 27 lands. It'll be okay. Um, just, just Mulligan. Well, you know, just look now, for the, I mean, the thing I would drop it down to 27 for would be like, I think Preordain is not on this list. Something like yeah. that. Just something to that yep. effect. Just more selection. Exactly. The cantrips are super good. Preordain's great. It's yeah. been on the list before. Other people are on it. Other people are on more cantrips than I am. Um, but uh, yeah, but no, nothing really notable here. Um, the, I was on and off Cascade buffs for a while. I got frustrated a couple times. I drew it early and it couldn't provide you the mana. Oh, I yeah. What is that one land in hand and hurt sometimes? Have but you now, about, um, City of Traders yeah. at all? I haven't thought about City of Traders as another ancient tomb. Yeah, I like think you do I want to play to like turn three and four, which is the definite friction. Um, but that early exactly. turn acceleration can be really sweet. It is really nice. I mean, it's a great land, um, and an ancient tomb's there for a reason. But the the deck, what you'll find is when you pilot. I mean, you, you've already discovered this, but other folks when they start piloting it, the deck is really greedy for pips. Like it really, oh, yeah. you know, really, really wants red and blue mana all the time. And so in our mana base, we try to support that how we can. One one thing to note is that um, Cephalic Coliseum is a flex pick. I like it just mm -hmm. because it can fuel a breach or get a Thoracle player in a pinch sometimes um, uh, if they're forgetful. Uh, and I mean, in a non black deck, like the 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 the. Um, the the cost of playing it in this slot is really, really it's, low. It's nil. Yeah, exactly. Um, nothing. Exactly. And this deck is on five basics right now. Um, so has been in the past on Magus of the Moon and Blood Moon and Cursed Totem and some stacks effects. But to be honest, the, the deck, it does not need stacks effects right now. Like it's, yeah. it's, it is, it's faster than those stacks effects want you to be. And uh, 
it it's got bigger fish to fry at three mana. You know, you don't want to be spending yeah. three mana on a Magus of the Moon. You want to be spending three mana on a Jessica's Wheel. Um, exactly. Yeah, all of the really good engines just tend to be at that point in the curve. And yeah, it seems like that's never the place where you would want to be tapping out for a back to basics or something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it depends on your meta. And if you're if you're like, wow, I'm in like a five color meta and I'm like the only two color player, mm -hmm. like dip go off you know jam more basics add more basics add back to basics magus whatever like go go to town um we can't run null rod effects though you just you just sure. can't do it so you know because the treasure we treasure is real nice so keep that in mind if you do want to go a slower stacksier route okay well let's go ahead and uh talk about opening hands you said that you highly prioritize a turn one crark Yes, I when do. You're going for it. This is just like, are we? We're not even considering pretty much anything else. Like, obviously, like uh, some some nut god hand will take whatever. But like, we're we're not yeah. really looking too hard at a hand that doesn't cast a turn one crack. Pretty much seems to be the flavor. I think so. I mean, unless unless you know that okay, this game jamming a turn one crack will be irresponsible because I need to make sure that I actually successfully put a copy of interaction on the sack. You know, like sometimes sometimes you're just like, hey, I'm gonna. Hopefully, I'll just hold up a Fluster Storm, turn one for, mm -hmm. for Nas or something or uh, whatever. And turn two, I'll play Aristic and hold up a Force. And then I'll I'll deal with the Kark stuff later. Like, sometimes that does happen. But for the most part, turn one Kark's going to be the best play. Now, what about a hand like this that's like a little bit awkward where we have the Ancient Ooh. Tomb, but like we have a good turn one play in Brainstorm. We're accelerating mm -hmm. towards the uh, the Phyrexian Metamorph that we have in hand, but it is just a little bit awkward. We're going turn two Krakra anyway, and then turn three uh, clone for it. Yeah, I wouldn't, to be honest with that hand, if I kept it, I'm a little iffy on it, but um, it does have four mana on turn two, which ain't too bad. And Metamorph can get somebody's Dockside, you know, so you can always go to town that way. But in this hand, in hands like this, usually I want to hold up that cantrip because mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I can brainstorm right now and it'll be okay, right? It'll be an all right card. Or I can turn one Arcane Signet and just bluff interaction, turn two Krark with uh, one mana, one color pip up, bluff interaction again, and hopefully brainstorm twice, question mark. And if you draw the right mm -hmm. kind of land, maybe, your calculations changed a bit. Maybe you can get out from under the brainstorm lock um, with a fetch. But I, I, this hand is, I think it's okay, but I, to me, it, it's not, it is neither fast enough and the and brainstorm is not the best source of card advantage in the deck. I think you yeah, want something sure. more explosive. Yeah, the thing about the brainstorm is that like it doesn't put the cards anywhere. It's the very classic just like legacy problem of brainstorm without a fetch land is a significantly less powerful card. Exactly. And you you know, you do have turn turn four, three Clark triggers, if uninterrupted here. That's oh that's not, you know, it's not that's not terrible. That's pretty good nice. <laughs> um and then you have Mind Break Trap, which I love. I think it's a great piece of interaction. Oh, yeah. But it just doesn't to me it doesn't have that critical mass of any one component, either disruption, acceleration, or ramp, or draw. Like it needs yeah. S something's off about it. I feel like maybe if this dual caster mage was like a uh, desperate ritual or something, oh, yeah. strike it rich or something that made a little bit of mana it would be a lot more enticing. Uh, let's take a look at another one. Okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. No, this is, I would, I mean, I'm greedy. I keep this in a second. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's snappy yeah. dappy keeps. Uh, that's, that's what we in the business say. Yeah. Yeah. Turn one Ruby Medallion and Krark with the Lotus Petal up uh, is very, very, very good. Um, turn two Sakashima is right there for you. Um, if you don't need to crack the pedal, and if you don't draw land, if you do draw land, you're you know you're in, you're in you're in good. And then turn three, well, just cast Spellseeker for Gitaxian Probe or something, or cast Solve the Equation and go get whatever you want off two Kark Triggers. That this is this is excellent. I mean, an early Ruby Medallion and Crypt is just like unbelievably. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing is that like our our uh, our suite of. Um of artifacts is like on the lighter side where I'm used to playing ad nauseum decks that are running like 16, 17 pieces of ramp so that we can look in very low. So like when we do get the uh, the mana crypt into Ruby Medallion and also there's a Lotus Petal Hands, it's just like Christmas Day. Like it doesn't get any it, better than that. It's it's so good too. Yeah, I mean, in, there's even a, a world in this hand in which you're turn twoing um, Archmage Emeritus instead of um, Takashima. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to slow roll it a little bit and also sponge out some removal. I can uh, see that. Because 
Archmage Merit is a nice card advantage engine. And then if yep. for some Christmassy land, like, hey, nobody sees what's coming and you land Sakashima with Archmage Emeritus and Krark, you're gonna be doing just fine. Just just solve the equation for some free interaction and no one will play magic for a turn and then you'll win. And it seems to be uh, in my playtesting that Spellseeker is like basically just one card win con. Like you go get Snap, yeah. you start generating mana with it and there's just mm -hmm. like almost no way to lose. Yeah, Spellseeker gets you every kind of effect in the deck that you could want. Um, it gets you Twin Flame if you need more clones. It gets you Snap if you need mana. It gets you all kinds of disruption. It gets you Rituals if you just need like a Rite of Flame or Desperate Ritual or whatever. Um, it, it Any effect, it gets it all. Um, and except Recursion. It doesn't, it doesn't get Recursion uh, because we're not on Finale Promise anymore. But again, trust me, uh, Invoke Calamity, so worth it. Um, oh my god, it's great. I started, I told you, testing um, Muddle the Mixture. I forget over what slot uh, because uh, Spellseeker can grab it. So being able to go grab essentially the Underworld Breach of Spellseeker seemed really, really awesome yeah. so far in testing. Absolutely. It's, 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 um, I was on Muddle for a while. I wound up cutting it just because I, um, I don't love one blue blue at sorcery speed. Oh yeah. To, like I, I I'll do it, right? I'll do it if I have to, but I don't love it. And I also breach to me is like that's plan Z. Like yes. I don't give it's a damn. One of about the selling breach. points to me about this deck is that breach does not fucking matter at all, and it's no. such a good bait spell. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. The, the how many times people have countered breach without even like looking at the board and thinking about the hand and grave like. It's just because we're all conditioned to be like, oh my mm -hmm. God, it's, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. Um, and the best part breed, is you can put on yeah. the show and be like, oh, I can't let you swan song that. I'll yep. get those triggers off a of fluster storm. And oh, they must really want this. So let's all spend our interaction on this breach. It's like, okay, and then I'll play Archmage Emeritus and win the game. <laughs> exactly. It's so beautiful. Like breach, breach is, is, is a, if you land it, most of the time, it will either generate enough value to set you up to win or win you the game just from just from recursion, not yeah. brain freeze. It do if you're brain good. freezing, if you're brain freezing, you're okay, cool, that's a win. But the amount, I'd say that probably freeze wins with breach, I don't know, 15% of my wins. I actually dropped the freeze for the muddle. It was the swap I made. I'm remembering. Oh, that's 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 extremely hot, and I support that. Um, there is a great psychological act of terrorism you can commit while playing this deck with a bunch of CDH players. Is pitch breach to gemstone caverns or chrome mox, and <laughs> yeah. everybody everybody shits their pants and starts crying. Um, and I and but again, the deck doesn't need it. It's mm. it is there because it's good recursion. It happens to win the game sometimes. Don't you do not need to pursue it as a game plan? Like whatever. It's that was come, my thought come dropping the freeze was that like the storm triggers are great, and I think that's obviously mm -hmm. the highest upside to it. Um, yeah. But it's so it's so unnecessary. It doesn't really like uh, of all the decks that brain freeze doesn't do anything, and I feel like this is like one of the higher tiers of not really doing a whole lot. The, the I, storm triggers yeah. again with storm Kilnars are gigantic, but there's so yeah. many different things in this deck that are essentially the same point. That like again yeah. like mana is so seldom your bottleneck that it doesn't seem yes. like those like super high upsides of the brain freeze triggers are all they're all that great yeah. or, or just what you need in particular there is there i absolutely anticipate the universe in which we're off freeze like it's it's there because yeah it's a cheap storm spelled instant speed it says storm right on it exactly exactly <laughs> but like i can i can see a world in which in the future we're on final fortune galvanic relay <laughs> You know what I mean? And oh, like, wow, go for it. Relay, my heart, my heart is beating. Yeah, I know. It's just because like, that card is so close. Um, but it's so close. It's so so close. close. <laughs> They're gonna but make I a better like one in three months, I'm sure. That, exactly. That's all we gotta do is wait, and they'll they'll print the ten at the storm scale cards. They'll do more of that because they sell like hotcakes. Um, but yeah, freeze is breach freeze. Whatever, like cool. But don't worry about it. If it gets exiled, if you lose it, what mm. just, don't, you don't care. Keep going keep drawing cards there are other ways to win many more ways to win yeah exactly like the whole list is just win con so like any one particular win con sure praetor's grasp but away from me i don't care uh, it so does hand, yeah. slam dunk <laughs> we're we're winning all day with this hand let's take a look at another one it's good yeah uh this one this one don't know do nope nope no land let's, and let's i've i have learned not to keep those in my life all right so we got a tavern's council which is very enticing but it seems like this is another non-keeper it's it's slow, but if you antis if you're in like a pod full of mid range decks and or like mid range deck and a stacks deck, mm. this might be considerable because 
you've got filtration on turn two. So you have a turn two Krark or Signet. Um, you've got, or Talisman. You've got a turn two Krark if you draw land, which hopefully you will. Um, you've got Imperial Recruiter or Tavern Scoundrel with a mana up, which is real nice. Um, or Snap, and then you'll have, you know, if you copy it, you'll have four mana, and that's real nice because you can get down the, the, the Talisman and Tavern Scoundrel. I, and Veyron is really, really good, you know? Yeah. So, and, and Imp Recruiter can find you draw because Imp Recruiter can find you Spellseeker. And I guess um, in the scenario that we are in a mid-range matchup, like Snap is one of the better interactive spells that we could have in that scenario. Yes, Snap Snap is incredibly good in the deck. Um, and a lot of times, right, you'll spell seekers for Snap. So the fact that it's already in your hand conserves mana. Uh, I think that this hand is keepable if you know you're gonna you're gonna like turn five plus it. If if you're yeah. worried about losing before then, I'd ship it. Look for a turn one Kark. Hmm. All right, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. This is this is some very solid medium value. Let's mm -hmm. Take a peek at yeah. another here. All right, this is some enticing spells here. I mean, the. Uh, right, like right now in my mind that's three lands because shatter skull is like i've cast it for its front side maybe three times that, yeah. in my life yeah it's it's there if you like if you're desperate to get rid of some hate bears or something but um you have probe and probe mm -hmm. is just so good so the fact that you, I mean, you don't have turn one kark but you do if you're lucky you you got tarn for volk island which hopefully somebody plays a forest so submerges online so you have early submerge for creature strategies, which is incredibly good. I can't stress, like, I have considered putting Yavimaya in this damn deck to turn on submerge because it is so good. It The fact that it disrupts creatures and, and makes forces your opponents to top deck a dead card for free is incredible. So you've got Probe I feel like that's something that people overlook too often is that like it bounces the creature, yes, but where it puts the creature is so painful. It's so, and, and I have seen people just be like, oh my God, am I gonna put my commander on top of my deck right now? Mm. And I'm like, hey, if you don't wanna draw your commander, don't put it in your command zone. Come on, have some respect, you know? Um, but uh, but yeah, so you've got Disruption, you've got Baral for cost reduction, you've got Pyroblast, which you can spam for Storm because you can just target a land mm. with it and just keep casting it over and over again. And you've got Probe, like Probe is incredible. Like if you can turn, you know, turn two Krark, Draw two cards ain't bad if you can last a little bit longer, if you can turn three or four, uh, start Gitaxian probing with Sakashima and a couple Kirk triggers. Great, great. Like, so I think this hand again is sort of a medium one. It's not fast, but it does have everything you kind of need. It doesn't have a ritual, but it has reduction. And probe is kind of a ritual just because free draws are, again, yeah. a kind of a, kind of a way to conserve. You're the mana enough. cost, yeah. So, I mean, it's just straight up. Exactly. So this is I, this is a, a medium hand. If you're again, if you're turn fiving it, if you think you're going to turn five ish the game, yeah, keep it. Try it. Like it's okay to turn two Kark. That's yeah. not the end of the world. And then I draw mean, two cards. The engines that we got are just really good. Like it's actually improving Baral. I um, I'm newer to the deck, so I, I haven't fully uh, fallen in love with the good cats. Uh, the good taxi probe yet, but I've heard you wax poetically about it ad nauseum for sure. I mean, you've you've seen me cast it a ton, too many times. Um, it's it's great. It's it's really good. It feels really good. Um, if you need to tap out for Sakashima, right? Mm. If so, if you're Clark and then Sokka, sometimes yeah. it's like, ooh, damn, like oh no, shields down. That kind of sucks, but. Sometimes you just start Gitaxian probing and you draw like eight cards. That's you know, the really you're important like... thing in these sort of slow hands too is like the density of the free spells that we can cast, like the Subverge and Gitaxian probes of world that allow yeah. us to tap out for Kark and then start getting value. Exactly. So yeah, and uh, and re you know, remember like one just one fierce guardianship or one force of will or one submerge or one whatever. That's not just one in this deck. So if you can draw into it when you're tapped out, don't don't stress too much, like because mm. that often means two plus um, off of one piece of interaction. So yeah, me, okay hand for a, for a medium or modal game. Okay, Let, let's try to find one more banger before we, before we, we move need on a, to our next We spot. need to turn one Krark. Have, I mean, we had to turn one Krark in the last, the, the, the oh, Mana the, Crypt. Uh, the nutty hand, yeah, 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 that, yeah. that hand was perfect. Um, this, this hand, I like, I just, I'm a big fan of turn one fish just every whenever i can and the fact that you have misstep to protect it is like ah. so if you if you think you're in a greedy pod yes you don't really have much action after that you don't have rituals you don't even have acceleration but if you're in a greedy pod and you can protect a fish a lot of times like early fish or early study don't worry about Krark. just play mm. control and draw cards 
Yeah, you know what I mean. And the then and then Clark later more towards saying it's keepable because I I have sort of shied away from the the turn one Mr. Cremora is good enough because man people people play around it in a way that they didn't people, used to. Yes, the, yes, the, absolutely. So if like if you're with a bunch of storm players who are gonna feed it, go for it. If you're with a bunch of people who are gonna lamb pass just to punish you. Mm. Maybe don't, maybe don't yeah. keep it because you don't, you don't have anything else to do. So that's not so. The bad. misstep definitely makes it a lot more attractive because it, yes. if, if, if it's like naked remora, everything is riding on this remora basically in this hand. If this was just like exactly. R six and this misstep didn't exist, then yeah, like it, it hurts real bad to lose it. But all right, let's mm -hmm. let's take a peek at another one here. Okay. Odawara mm -hmm. ponders. Uh, this this hand is also a little slow for my taste, um, but. The fact that it has two cantrips and then Spellseeker is a little bit nice. Like a, a turn one ponder, right? Which is probably the best cantrip in the deck. Um, yeah, I think it's the best cantrip in the deck. A turn one ponder is is not terrible. And then you know you have Bergy, so that if you're able to get probe off Spellseeker, you can start generating red mana. Um, well, which let is me propose nice. to you that we can turn one brainstorm and turn two ponder to break up the brainstorm. Absolutely, yes, exactly. See, that's that that's that constructed this that sixty car constructed brain at work that I just do not have. <laughs> it's um, a lot but more yes. easy when you have four and four uh, of each in the in the deck and then you <laughs> run into that a lot more often. Yeah, exactly. I to be honest though, looking at this hand again, no turn one Clark. Yeah. And no, no really not much interaction. Like yeah, Psych Rift is good, but and it's like barely an interaction uh, spell though, you know. I know. It, it saves you exactly. from some things, but you're certainly not enough. Yeah, this is just like the, the it's that gap between one and three here that we have just nothing to really push us forward. Uh, another oh no landers, so <laughs> no landers, ship push it. That one. Sad though. This this is excellent. This hand is excellent. Yeah. This is perfect. Like yeah, this yes, is exactly you, what you want. You don't have turn one Krark, but you have Dockside, which at minimum in my experience usually is a plus two sometimes it's only rarely a plus one but usually it's a net at minimum two so there you go like you got very it. conservative in my play testing with dock siding just like okay it never makes more than like five mana at any given point even yeah, though it's usually I, like fucking 11. yeah i know exactly i my rule of thumb when goal fishing and play testing is dock side the dock side count is always going to equal your turn count plus two um that's because that's it's not super aggressive on the early turns i think it's kind of honest on the early turns and then on the later turns it's it it gets less good as the turns progress yeah proportionally so but a turn two dock side i i can't tell you how often this play pattern has happened for me it's very very common turn two dock side dock side makes a bunch of mana you snap the deck dock side you make more mana you're you've got like eight ish mana six to eight ish mana Okay, play Clark, play Harmonic Project and pass the turn with Mystical Tutor up. Like you're you're in a great place because you're gonna untap with Jessica's will two Clark triggers, if not four Clark triggers, if you land Sakashima before it. So don't you know you don't have to try to do the snap value game with Clark. You can just say, all right, Dockside just Dockside snaps just a real good early ritual, and I've got Mystical Tutor for draw, and I've got Harmonic Project for more triggers. Like. Yes, no turn one Clark, but you have literally everything else you need. Yeah, Sertar asking if we turn one Mystical Tutor. I think uh, my instincts, I will say, is that I would want to turn one Mystical Tutor for like the action spell that we're sort of missing yes. here. Maybe like the Frantic mm -hmm. Search uh, yep. or something along those lines. I guess Jessica's Will is actually just like Numero it's, Uno where we want to be. Yeah, I think a safe turn. And per th just to answer this question in a roundabout way, but Personal Tutor was once in the list for that very reason, you know, just because a turn one personal tutor to, to, to put Jessica's well on the top is great. And then you don't have to worry about Clark bouncing it and saying, ah, no, you don't do it. Um, but Mystical Tutor is more flexible in that way. You can yeah. wait, um, or you can just say, eh, I'm just gonna burn it turn one. And, uh, and it's great too, because you're bluffing interaction at the same time. You know, so. I do remember the days of the personal tutor and the the extension that it forces you into is sort of just like it's it's almost yeah. a bridge too far, especially if you're going for Jessica's will, where it's kind of like okay, now I know this is coming and we're all going to dump our hands as quickly as possible. Yeah, every exactly like the personal tutor with Jessica's will on the top now historically in 2022 this deck will make everyone uh, put on Kabuki masks, scream at you, and try to stab you until you are dead like physically in real life. So just don't, don't, don't do it, right? Like, wait, wait, sandbag, That's hide actually information. Uh, an interesting point. Are, are there ways that you like uh, psychologically 
play this deck differently now than ways that you used to, especially over like the past couple of weeks where there's been much more kick up post uh, Marchesa about Quark yeah. and like, uh, are there any like different ways that you're approaching tables and uh, stack interactions and things like that with people? Yeah, there's been there's been some good conversation in the Thumbless Discord about adjusting, right? Because now there's more heat on the deck, there's more attention. Um, and I think in most circumstances, most players have already kind of, players who played a lot already kind of adapted to the play pattern we're now kind of advocating for, which is like, if you play this deck into a regular pod, like in a local play group or something, they'll, within five, 10 games, they'll get it. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's you, you know what it does. It's an engine deck, can be very disruptive or very explosive and okay, just like you just play against it. Um, and you know when to interact for the most part, you know how to respond to triggers. Um, so the regulars are all probably pretty much playing like they were pre Marchesa, but for the folks who are concerned and like want to change their play pattern, I, I, I would encourage them to know that you're probably not going to convince other players to not be a little bit irrationally um, worrisome about a single crook. Mm. Um, I don't think there's really too much politicking that can be done anymore rhetorically to be like, hey, like this could be a self stacks piece or like it's 50 50 this mystical tutor to returns back to my hand because people just are like, no, like that card is the engine. The engine is bad. Disrupt the engine. Mm. Um, and uh, so I, I don't think we can really do that, which means that inclines me to do one of two things don't give a damn and jam it anyway and make people burn their interaction and just be like whatever i'll recast Kark for four later that's fine it's fine like i pay four for Kark. all good um and and make them use their interaction or uh if you want to be more political about it more wary just bluff control just just p pretend like you're playing and is a control deck like niv you know and uh, just be like hey i got all the interaction in the world and i'm just going to be responsible here and then off a of big dock side or off a of turn to storm kill an artist with a mana vault or something then start spinning the wheels and try to go for it all on one turn you know mm -hmm. um i think that 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 might be a more common play pattern but at, at the same token i think just like just forcing your way through it oftentimes it just works because the there's so there's so many good creature threats and people are still not playing enough creature removal. Yeah. And so a lot of times you're just like, okay, Kark got swords. I'll play Harmonic Prodigy on this following turn. I'll recast Kark. I'll cast a Gitaxian Probe and let's try it again. You know, or like, it just doesn't, there are so many uh, mid-rangey cards, creature cards that you're like, well, okay, one piece of an engine gets disrupted. Well, I'm not in black. So I have four more of the same thing. I'm just gonna wait, draw cards, and play control, and and see, and you know, go go for it a little bit later. Um, yeah, so I'd say I'd say don't worry about it. Don't try. Don't even really try to politic too much, other than just pointing out the fact that like you're not a Thoracle deck, you don't have access to Black Tutors, and your life total does matter. Probably doesn't matter as much as Nas in the first two turns, but like yes, we're on Trees and Soger and Taxing Probe now. Like fine, um, but. You know, don't worry about it too much. Just ride the coin. Just have fun. Yeah. Ride the coin. Pay for That's actually a again. really important lesson that I've learned from you as a player. Where like there are many situations as a Quark player where you can be uh, like biting your fingernails and really be sweating it out. And you are eternally a person who is just like, it does not matter if I win this game, so I will not worry about it. And whatever yeah. happens, happens. And you know what? Yeah. If you're cool and calm and collected, it's, it's a lot easier to be able to sculpt your hand more effectively while it's, all the other bullshit is going on. Because either it, you're going to come yeah. to the point where there's that uh, link in the armor that's broken, or you're not, and that's fine too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, I find like the the Bill Murray Bill Murray school of like peak performance is when you're maximally relaxed. I subscribe to that, and and I think that the deck actually encourages you structurally to kind of be like that because yeah. again, you're you're getting owned sometimes, and it's just sort of like, well, okay, like you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You go home either way, happy if you did something thrilling, um, and that's going to be the case regardless of what you do. Like if you have to spend 10 mana forcing Kark through, that's fun too. Cause that tells you how much people respect the deck, fear it, you know, are terrified yeah. of losing to it. Like that's great. That's fun. You're it's you're you're really playing like a threat. About this deck, yeah, because like yeah. in the situations where you're not winning, you are still having a lot of fun because you're putting the table to the test every time, and the, it just is a deck that commands so much respect at the table that like you you know yes. you, you're never going to be one of those people who are like oh I've just got nothing to play the whole game or like you know it happens but like certainly less so. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes just know like 
even if it's not Kark related. And like sometimes the the circumstances conspire such that you really are not going to win the damn game. Like you're just you just know it. You're like, okay, there's been a lot of creature removal. There are a couple stacks decks. They're layering really fast. I'm just like, I'm not in it. Uh, that's okay. Just know that you know. Always play your outs. Never think that you're you're totally screwed because you're you never are. Right? As long as you can draw a card and untap, you can always always find an out. Um, just play your outs and uh, and yeah, keep, stay cool, calm, and collected. Because again, the deck is very redundant. So don't worry. There's always another potential win con around the corner, and your commanders are cheap as hell. So you can always recast them in most circumstances. Yeah, if the game's not over, it's still not over. Just yeah, every single yeah. draw step is another live chance. It's definitely exactly. It's it's very helpful to keep in mind, and it will really like carry you through a lot of situations because it's so easy to throw games to the tilt that you can get yourself in, just being like, oh, I have no chance, so I'm not even going to try to think of the outs that I can be playing towards. Whereas like, if you are cool and you're just like, okay, well, let's take a mental checklist or do as I call the the cheating method of taking a look at your own deck list. Uh, you'll be able to find something. Your deck is good, you know? Like, you just gotta yeah. find your way to wiggle out of whatever kind of situation. Exactly. Uh, are there any other sort of, like, uh, overarching storm philosophies or any special things that you want to talk about uh, with the deck before we go to a Q&A with the chat? Yeah, there's one thing that I wanted to make sure to mention. Um, we get in the Thumbless Discord, folks will um, often ask questions about certain cards. Like, uh, one that comes up all the time, so much so that we have a custom Discord command for it, is Tosh's Hideous Laughter. It's, uh, you know, it's that one blue-blue instant where opponents exile cards from their libraries or whatever, like some, you know, 14 card, uh, exile sorry, until they a, hit a certain uh, space mana. In the, uh, yes, there is. So if you, if you go down to um, uh, Options, and scroll down. Then there you go. Have you ah, considered okay. the Have You Considered Library? So this attempts to answer every single question about, hey, have y'all considered, have y'all considered, have y'all, con right? Like it, the question has already been discussed thoroughly by a lot of people. And so I've tried to take the Discord's wisdom and, and make it permanent somewhere so that people can just say like, hey, check the primer, answers there, good to go. You know, and we've got kind of an archive. Um, but this also maybe informs players who are curious about the deck. You can kind of learn about a deck knowing what it's not on more so mm. than what it is on in many circumstances. And I think that that's, that's true of us too. But overarching storm philosophies. No, I think, I mean, I think that this, this deck is very popular now because it is, pr it is fun to flip coins and gamble while you're playing magic. Like people like gambling apparently. Um, so don't forget that. You know, don't forget that the, the deck is meant for fun. And if you are an efficient pilot, if you can move quickly through your turns and be considerate of your opponents and help them understand it, it should be fun for the opponents too. Um, if you're in a, an LGS or a, a, a local meta or an event in which people are pretty hostile to you, like are mean to you for the fantasy cardboard choices you're making, I would encourage you to be direct with them and I encourage them to reconsider their cruelties and know that like you're just you're you're picking a cup you're putting a couple legal cards in the command zone and you're putting 98 legal cards in your deck uh, and you're a good pilot and you'll be competent and you'll move quickly and storm is just a feature of magic it is not a bug um, and uh, and just try to deal with it you know there have been some some kind of sad tales in the last few days in particular people who. Uh, just like, yeah, the play groups that they were playing with were just like, no, no more of this deck. Like, we're not, we, we, we don't want to see it. And so they're like, ah, what do I play now? You know, and they're asking the Discord, like, what other decks do y'all recommend? Which is a bummer. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sad to hear it because, again, I play this hobby because it's frivolous and I want a, my other consenting adults to do what they want with the fantasy cardboard game pieces that they like. Um, but that's not the case for everybody. So just, just keep in mind that, like, some people might have strong thoughts about it and strong emotional responses to it. Uh, but ultimately, you're playing the game to have fun. So, you know, if this deck doesn't work for you, no problem. If it doesn't work for your group, no problem. There are other fun Storm decks that you can deal, you know, that you can find. It ain't the only show in town, but it is the only show in town that needs you to flip 500 coins to win with a lightning bolt. So, 
Nice. Uh, well, very quickly before we move on, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to Pixelated Spirits, UC Blink Rider, and Mike McGall for the follows. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to do the Q&A next. Ken, we've been chatting for like an hour and a half, though. Do you want to take a quick five before we move to the next one? Do you need to take that, a break at all? That's entirely up to you. I'm okay if you are, but if you want to take a break, no I'm good problem. to move on as long as you are. I just wanted to give yeah. you the opportunity. All yeah. right, so yeah. Whoops, hit my uh, my mute button. If anyone mm -hmm. in chat has uh, questions that they want to ask uh, Ken or myself, anything that we didn't get into in the list here, any specific questions, uh, just go ahead and uh, ask them. We'll try to uh, get as many as that we got here. We did have uh, uh, Tommy earlier asking about Invoke Calamity. We spoke about that pretty extensively, though. It has been mm -hmm. uh, quite good for you, and it seems like it's been quite good for uh, other people. Yeah, uh, every, I think it, testing it. I think everybody who switched from Finale Promise has really been pleased. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's pretty close to a strict upgrade. Uh, just the instant speed thing really pushes it way over the top. And the fact that it hits your graveyard and your hand, it's, it's just mechanically it is so powerful that I think it justifies the cost. And I think that's been everybody's. I, I've had like some people in the thing have been like, I go for Invoke Calamity as often as possible because mm -hmm. it is that good. So it's sort of like, Jessica's will ish. Um, yeah. The, it, so I think I think we're I think we're sold on it. I think it's in a good place. The recursion seems to be particularly unique. I don't know if I I saw the um, recall if that had ever been tested uh, in this list in your oh, exclusions yeah. page. Some some people some people have been on recall. I think recall has been more popular in uh, Kark Silas, hmm. which has a little bit higher density of rocks. Um, that you can pick up and put down again for fun and profit. Um, oh no, I'm thinking Repealed. Recall, is that the one where you pick up all your artifacts? What is that? Uh, recall is, I think it's double blue and X, or maybe it's uh, blue and double X, and you put an amount of instants or sorceries from your graveyard into your hand. It's from Legends. Oh, yes, yes. This one this one is extremely good in Aruth. Um, mm. Oh no, 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 that's not the, no, Breakthrough is the one that's good in Aruth. Oh, this yeah. one, yes. People have considered it a lot. We've talked about it as like, hey, we're in Is It. We lack really solid recursion options. And this does pick up cards like, and gets can get a lot of them. But here's the thing about XX spells in Kark's Akshima. You really want to avoid high mana value spells because mm. it's they just hurt real, real bad yes. when yeah, you yeah, lose yeah. flips on them. That and, makes a lot of sense. You know, so yes, Invoke Calamity is five, but it's also all in red. Yeah. And you don't have to, right? And so that's like real, real good. Uh, yeah, the high value red, red spells are really, really important. Uh, we got a, a question from Penny Manog who asks, Ken, are you ready to give my P-Storm another go? Can't hold on to all your bad flips. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Possibility Storm was in the list um, for a while. And, I, you know, it's a hell of an engine with Kark. And it's very disruptive. Like, I, there's one player, very good player, former Legacy Storm player um, in our local play group who never won a game when I resolved Possibility Storm in this list. Uh, and he was on a four color pile with like the Oracle console, like very, very good deck, excellent player. But it just, it's super disruptive. It's a great engine with Kark because you can stack the triggers, but I don't think, I, I personally don't feel it as if I need it. Um, it I don't want to- It superfluous. I, I don't want to spend five mana on, a, on an enchantment engine. Like, you know, I, I just it feels a little off to me and also you can drain a flock yourself in certain cir circumstances yeah. if you get unlucky and uh, I'm also not trying to make Draneth Magistrate an even better card <laughs> against us <laughs> it's not what I dream about you know uh, we got Sir Fala asking uh, if I remember that you used to run Remand yep. in this list for me it always felt like a strong card why aren't you running it anymore I know that you swapped that for um the the treasonous ogre is the yep. do you find that it is uh, not uh, powerful enough for the list anymore I think Remand's great, and for me, when I looked at the list of disruption, because I was like, I think I'm going to go down a disruption spell, and we and we talked, chatted about this a, a while ago about Treason Soger in the in the Thumbless Discord. Mm. I just I could not bring myself to cut any of the other disruption spells. I was like, I just there they weren't like physically. I was in pain. I was like, I cannot <laughs> cut these other cards. It's like really I just really hard. I the cuts at this point are so difficult. It's like pulling teeth. So yeah. Um, I narrowed it down to unsub and remand. And I know that that yeah. seems conspicuous because both of those spells can pit, can save a spell in the stack for you so that you don't all copy and send it to the graveyard. And that's like a cool, interesting, fun line to extend your storm turn. But I was like, I put them both there because it's like, well, if we lack one, we still have the other mm -hmm. and that's good and important. 
Um, and I stuck with unsub because I had had a few too many experiences on remand where putting the spell back in the person's hand wasn't so good. You know, mm -hmm. like you don't you don't want somebody to try to Nas twice. You want them to try to Nas once and fail. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And and so even with even with the remand thing where you can counter your own spells to draw cards, which is great, like huge, right? Yes, kind of advantage trickery very, logic. Very, uh, good, but. It's super good, but I stuck with unsub for the sole reason that that A, it can hit uncounterable spells. So the Veils of the Summer and Caverns of Souls just doesn't matter, say whatever. It can hit uncounterable spells, and more importantly, it is an EOT bounce spells for creatures. And I feel like hate bears, Staxi hate bears, real, real important for us to be able to bounce into turn and then untap for, for and untap and be free. Um, so I, I think I, unsub to me edges out in its in its mo modality or it's being modular. Yeah, it's a yeah. little bit better in my mind than Reband. That makes a lot of sense to me. Those are actually yeah. some of the weak points that I was considering because I, I like I said I was looking for a couple swaps that I could make and uh, I th I think I put in that new Capenna spell um, an offer you can't refuse. Yeah, I'm, the I'm treasure maker. Giving that a shot over unsub at the moment. Um, it's it's it seemed very peculiar in. Uh, <laughs> Play testing. As soon as it came up, I was like, "Okay, I need to pretend there's actually another spell on the stack now and see how this really works." I, I know, I know. Like, yes, I think that over time, my bet, and this is speculation, so keep that in mind. And it's just personal. This isn't the product of consensus or anything. And very community, famous for talking out of his ass. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Um, I I think that over time we'll probably move a little bit away from the whole counter your spells for fun and profit thing. Mm -hmm. um, I I just don't think we'll need it anymore because that would that's yeah. like you know that's like a sneaky way to manipulate the stack to your advantage. Like oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna point half my fluster storm copies at the other half and I'm gonna loot twenty cards with brawl or whatever. Like <laughs> that that's good. It's all fine and good, but I just don't find myself needing to do that most games. And and I yeah. think that we'll we'll keep going in that direction. And so, yeah. yeah now the core that, engines are yeah. just so strong that those sorts of cute interactions that maybe would push you to the edge in those other circumstances, uh, previous to things like Storm Kilnars and things like that, like those sorts yeah. of things are just a lot less necessary, it seems like at this point. Exactly, exactly, yep. Uh, we got Shane Dino asking, uh, not directly related to this deck, but more so Kark in general, any new Kark partners that you've, uh, you are or have brainstormed outside of Tim and Thrasios? Yeah, I mean those are those are my mains for sure. I play those three regularly. I mean, people are really hot, real hot on Kark Silas. Um, it's just a fast Grixis list where you can, you know, if you double a demonic consultation real early, it's pretty good. Uh, double Tainted Pact or Demonic Tutor, real good. And then you're in black, blue, and red, which are probably the strongest colors in the format. Um, and so Kark Silas is a lot of fun. It's Grixis for gamblers. Um, Kark is shy. Is sort of a Staxier list, which is interesting to see Kark break parity on stacks pieces that it plays. Like that's that's kind of a counterintuitive thing, but it it has worked for um, players. And uh, having a shy is really nice too, because you can pressure opponents with a shy and take heat off Kark. So that people panic about a shy that's going to kill them, and then remove it, and then it's like, oh cool, you spent the one swords to plowshares, yes. the one exile effect in your deck. Woohoo! It's storm time. Um, you know, bounce your own stuff and go. Uh, Park Ikra people have brewed a little bit um, just to do Jund Storm stuff, which seems fun. We, you, you get Wither Bloom there too, which is great. Mm. Um, for Ark, I love the idea, not in competitive, but, um, and people have brewed it, which is great. I love the idea of Kark's at Ark Condo. <laughs> As like a Naya like store oh. like tokens list. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and just for like casual and yeah, you um, double up your like March of the Multitudes. You and you get to play Empty the Warrens. Oh. Um you know what I mean? So like that just seems that's just fun to me. I think that's it's really cool, cute. Like um and uh, but I think in terms of like the strongest partners, Kark Tavesh, right? Mm -hmm. That's real good. Um, that's just a Rakdos Storm list with Tavesh in its own, so you can sacrifice Kark to unlock your Pitas and stuff so that you don't, you know, spend seven mana to do nothing. Um, uh, but I think really the the main the main partner pairs that have been explored to a good degree are Sakshima, Thrasios, Timna, Silas, Ashai, Ikra, Tavesh. That's like the core. And then other yeah. partners are all tentatively explored here and there, but really those are the those are the main ones. 
Uh, we've got uh, Seratar asking tips for politicking with this deck. I know that you kind of discussed that a little bit earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. Different strategies from piloting other decks. Yes. Um, make sure to still, I still think it's useful to just say aloud, right? If somebody thinks that resolving Krark singularly wins you the game, that the odds are real, probability theory is is useful and true. And so 50-50 ain't 100%. And Jessica's will plus Krark is five red mana and a coin flip to maybe win the game. Thoracle consult is three mana and it just wins the game. Doesn't need to flip a coin. So we're not just just try to remind people you're not in Grixis. You do have, there is a downside, right? Unless um, you're playing you, Kirk Silas, then you're fucked. Yes, and then you're fine. You can't lie and just 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 go fast. Um, also, I think it's worth drawing attention as always. This is a useful political tool always, but definitely practice it. Draw attention to the obvious threats, right? Mm -hmm. Like if somebody puts a Nas on the stack, react. Be like, oh my god, you know, like. Be, use your face and body and self mm. to your advantage. Be like, that's bad. Like, or what are we doing about that? Draw attention away from you. That's useful always. Um, but I think the, the main thing to do at this point historically is just know that there are times in which you are going to have to say or argue to an opponent because you've got hidden information that like, I don't have a win in my hand. Dan, you've said this in a recent Mind Sculptors video, right? Like. Sometimes I will say, and this is true, I don't lie. I don't lie in, in Commander games. I say, I don't have a win in hand right now, right? If you got Jessica's will in hand, that's technically true. It's not gonna, you need, right? You can't win yeah. the game strictly by casting Jessica's will a million times. You have to find Grape Shot or Bolt or whatever. So I don't have a win in hand. Or, you know, if you have like an impulse or something that's gonna hopefully copy a couple times, you'll find something, but just, be be honest, be forthright about your resources, but know what cards actually do in the deck and yeah. what, what you actually need to do to win. Because if you can communicate that clearly to an opponent and say like, yes, dual cast for Twin Flames in the deck, I don't control a creature right now and nobody's gonna give me one with the Forbidden Orchard. So you know, and I don't run Ragavan, so you know I'm gonna have to play at least a two mana value creature in order to have a target for Twin Flame, right? Like, know what the deck does, know what its capabilities are, so you can communicate them clearly. And uh, and then remind people that sometimes you are gonna have to play Control, and that that sometimes is good for the table, right? Like, yes, nobody wants you to have Fierce Guardianship, uh, or disrupt, uh, deflecting SWAT because copying and returning to your hand is can be really hard to work through, but mm. it is also useful if you're facing down decks that you know are going to put out Haymaker after Haymaker. Sometimes you just got to remind Pod, like, hey, yeah, I know you don't want me to have it, but having it right now it's probably prevents us from losing. So, like, yeah, counter it if you want to, but just bear that in mind. That is a risk. You know, mm. if you get if you get rid of my interaction, maybe we lose, and that's okay. That's okay, right? You get to make the decision and you get to see if it worked out or not. And that's learning. So go for it. Nice. Um, Excellent. You know what I mean? Just like, hey, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is all, it's just calculated risk taking. That's all the deck does to an nth degree. Yeah. And I think so, that's an important thing to keep in mind is that, again, like, it's been said a million times, but it, it can be said a million different ways that ending, uh, the losing the game is not the worst of all fates. You are like, you're at all points performing an experiment with every action that you're taking in a game, and you're going to find out whether or not the experiment that you're taking is a correct or good one. And maybe you will learn <laughs> to not do it a second time. Exactly. Yeah. And then otherwise, um, general principle wise, look for turn one Quark and just run through all the assaults. Just people are going to throw tomatoes and bottles and cans at you while you try to storm off. Right. Like just run through it. Just don't give a damn. Just yeah. try, you know, like because uh, the, the, yeah, the the nature of the deck is such that if you draw free interaction through Mystic Remora or Mystic Study, your opponent's hand or whatever you'll probably be okay. Um, cause, cause they're not gonna, they're not going to be able to reuse the force of will they draw. You will. No, exactly. Yeah. They have the, the, um, the chances to be drawing into their fierce guardianships and their force of wills. And you just have a fierce guardianship and that's all you're going to need the entire time while you're storming off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So sometimes just turn on Clark, YOLO it, have fun, try to storm early or, you know, play control and then 
quirk, quirk later, but um, don't worry too much. The deck, again, the deck's redundancy is really, I think, its core feature at the moment. Yeah. So just don't worry too much. The deck can support either play style just fine. And if Kirk gets blown out, it's okay. It, you know, just just try to make the game last a little bit longer, true true mid range style, and redeploy, and you'll you'll probably be all right. Nice. Uh, we got a question here from let's see, uh, from Asapi Jakob. Uh, what are some cards that have been on the chopping block for you lately? Is there anything that's like uh, underperforming? Anything that's a little bit less impressive than you would want it to be? No, I mean to be honest, like the deck is in a really, 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 mm. really good place. Like I. I think everybody, the, just the fact that like cuts are excruciating for everybody in the Discord, yeah. that really shows like it, we're just like we're in an abundance of riches at the moment. When you have and to have so, those very minute conversations about the the uh, advantages of unsubstantiate versus romantic, you know you're in I'm, a good place in life. Exactly. So it's like I think we're good. I think we're chilling right now. I I would love to get rid of breach eventually. I don't mm -hmm. think I don't really see it happening soon, um, but it's just it's just there. You know, it's just a generically good card for us, really. Um, so I would love to get rid of Breach Freeze and open up two more slots. I think that'd be super cool. Honestly, um, the way to think about Breach at this point is it's like a two mana thought seize. Like, you know, it's just your counter check for yeah. what's going on. <laughs> it is very true. A lot of times it's just like, okay, yeah. Are they gonna, are they gonna interact or not? Yeah. It's a, yeah, two mana because it always seems question. like a thing that like, well, we have to counter this, otherwise we will just lose. And it's like, well, you'll just lose either way, but yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think there are any, I mean, the nice thing about this list is it's been so poured over and played and talked about, and like, there's been a ton of energy put into it and labor. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty tried and true at this point. And the fact that, you know, we had a summit, a summit, we had a, we had a big group conversation of like 20 folks, all who play Kark Sakshima, um, for four hours, we hashed out like uh, the the core features of the deck, and we agreed on ninety three cards. That tells you where the deck's at, yep. you know. So it's it's in a good place, and it's only going to keep getting better. That's the that's the fucked up thing about this deck is like Wizards is not going to stop printing good one mana value instants or sorceries in blue and red. They just won't stop, and so every set will will bring us a card to consider. And that's the bar amazing. Is like, it's it's amazing how great the quality of the ninety eight is, and yet the bar for a new Kark card is like so low. <laughs> I know, because it's like, imagine you're a competitive commander player and you get excited about in the festivities. That happened to like maybe hundreds of human adults across the surface of the earth. Like that's crazy, mm. right? Like, and yet that's what this deck supports. Any one mana value instant or sorcery in red or blue that is even vaguely useful can can be a win con, can make or like can start a new line, like an offer you can't refuse. Oh cool. Now we have another way to counter our own spells from mana. At one mana. And it's also a counter spell. Woohoo! Yeah. You know, a hard like one too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Better than Swan Song. So it's like, you know, these things are gonna keep popping up. Um, so the deck is almost guaranteed to continue to get better as time mm. progresses. Like it doesn't have as doesn't have as um, established a ceiling as as higher color decks do. Because mm. right, because you're not going to see more one mana value black spells that like are incredible printed. Yeah, Wizards there's never going to be a replacement not, not do for it. like Vampiric Tutor. Exactly, and so the ceiling of this deck is, I think, much higher. So I think it it can be very sustainable for the future. Um, I think I think it I think it has a much better prospects to grow as a deck than a lot of other three plus color decks do. In a similar train of thought, we've uh, had a couple of questions about uh, uh, casual Kark and Sakashima decks. I don't think that you personally keep one. What what are your like uh, what are your attitudes on it though? Do you think that is um, do you think that there are appropriate ways to bring it to a more casual environment? Yeah, absolutely. We've got we do have some casual pilots in the Discord who talk about it. I have a, a, a local in my meta, the guy Nathan. He's got a, a million billion decks. He's crazy, a real good brewer. He has a, a um, like a crouching Orvar hidden Zada Kark Sakashima deck that just wants to Orvar and Zada with Kark and Sakashima and make a million permanents and you know a bajillion triggers. But it is it is casual though. It's all right, right? Like you're. It's not going to win on turn three. 
in, no, in like any it's certainly, I think, a, like, obviously you want to stay away from the Fierce Guardianships and deflecting yes. swats of the world, and, like, yep. even Jeska's will, I think, is probably, yep. like, I don't know, depending on the power level of your pod and everything like that, like, some people love just playing high power, and they're playing good, yeah. like, interactive, but nutty mm -hmm. things. Yeah, he cut, he wound up cutting, because he wanted to keep it at a certain power level, he cut Jeska's will, Fierce, SWAT, like, all the kind of obvious all-stars. Yeah. Um, but you know what the funny thing is? It's like, it turns out if you're in blue and red, and you're playing an engine deck with some storm payoffs, it's naturally going to incline itself to the higher power scale because yeah. storm has always historically been super threatening. And there are so fewer, it just kind of is what it yeah. is. There are far fewer spells that you can cast a bunch of times for free <laughs> that like don't drastically alter the board state or something. Exactly. So, you know, the game, I mean, the engine is sort of built to break the rules. So just keep that in mind. But I think you can do it. I think the easiest way to do it is, yeah, cut the obvious all-stars. Don't run a bunch of fast mana. And um, make your instants or sorceries higher mana value. You know, make them like four plus mana. Because mm, like the then it's Opuses like... Or whatever that spell is. Like things like that, like the big splashy spells. Like, oh, yeah. copying Crackling yeah. Counterpart. So however many times. Exactly. Or crackling counterpart, I'm sorry. Whatever the big red quadruple X spell is. Yeah, yeah, yes, cackling something, something. Uh, crackling power or whatever. Yeah, um, but yeah, exactly. Just run the big bombs, and then it'll be very funny if you flip a coin or two and have <laughs> spent 11 mana to do nothing. That's funny and cool. <laughs> um, and it will also be funny and cool if you spent 11 mana to, you know, cat, you know, deal like 80 damage. That's also fun and cool. So. There's, there, you know, you can do it. Just be conscious yeah. of what you're up to and your tempo. You'll be fine. Yeah, it's definitely worth like checking in with everyone yeah. at the table and making sure mm -hmm. that you're appropriately doing it. But it seems like it could be a lot of fun. Uh, well, we yeah. just had sort of one last random question uh, from Hal and a couple other people wondering how they can get signed uh, cards from Ken. But I know the answer to this question. They can just DM you on Twitter and you will send them one. Someone also wanted to yeah. know if you would alter one for them. And I would yes. I would post to this person, maybe you should go to Ken's website and buy a couple of his books and then he would be happy <laughs> to alter one for you uh, in that situation. Um, I think we're probably moving to the end of our Q&A though. Ken, do you want to yeah. just like give us any final plugs while I uh, look for a person for us to raise out of here tonight any final yeah. thoughts on uh, anything that we talked about and uh, just general plugs absolutely well i'll say you know to the altar folks yes i constantly keep uh keep that thing on me and have 10 plus copies of Kirk in my closet at all times to sign and send to people uh just send me a pm ask for one tell me if you want me to draw crudely you know poorly not necessarily crudely probably just poorly draw poorly on it and i will try my best um, but uh, yeah, I'll send them to you for free. I just want people to have have things that make them happy. And uh, if me scribbling on a piece of cardboard makes you happy, I'll do it. Just let me know your mailing address. Something um, that would make me happy is if you told people how they could give you money on the internet for things. Though. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, I, I know you tried to you you did to try to do that. People. You did that, and I appreciate it. Yeah. So um, you can give me money on the internet by going to kenbauman.com um, and you can find out, the, uh, find out about the books I have written there um, and you can buy copies of those books and uh, some of them I'll send to you directly others the publisher will send to you or you can buy them on Amazon or whatever uh, and that way I'll see a little cash but no pressure um, I'm, I'm really just here to hopefully bring some delight to folks and uh, and then if you want to find out more about my magic stuff, Stack TDH. We're on YouTube and I'm on Twitter. I talk there a lot. And uh, if you wind up watching the videos and have any questions or comments or want help with anything, just send me an email at stackdh at gmail.com and I'll try to get you set up. I'm feeling good. Awesome. Well, Ken, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. I told you this would be like a 45 minute top session. We've been sitting here for two hours gabbing about <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So. Yeah, I, I knew I kind of suspected you put us together in a room. We can bullshit a lot. And then you got yeah, a great, you got a great community in chat, throwing out gift subs and good questions. And what are we going to do? Yeah, I, I really, really appreciate you making time to come out here. I really, really appreciate everyone throwing out the huge amount of gift subs. Uh, new people come to the Patreon tonight. I, I really, really appreciate everyone throwing them up the big support.